hello everyone thank you for being here welcome to the kickstarting your comic panel uh during this day which is the helioscope mini con over zoom uh i am your host Layla del duca i'm a cartoonist living in portland oregon with these two fellas uh i mean we share our studio i don't live with them uh <laughs> <laughs> but our studio is Helioscope, and today we're talking about kickstarting our comics. But without further ado, uh, I will start off by introducing myself. I am Leila Del Duca. I am a cartoonist, I already said that, uh, but I, <laughs> I got more notoriety on the scene when I started drawing Shudder at Image Comics, and I've also worked on books. Um, I drew Sleepless, and I wrote Afar over at Image Comics. And I've most recently kind of uh, been working more for DC on work for hire stuff. And I did a graphic novel called Wonder Woman Tempest Tossed. But um, I don't know if my career would be where it is now without Kickstarter because um, I have, the reason I go to this platform is because it allows me to have funding to survive and make the books that I want to. And one of the successful Kickstarter campaigns I was part of uh, funded the Pantheon project, which allowed me to get better at my artwork uh, enough to get hired on Shutter, which is the book that kind of increased my visibility as a comic book, book artist. And the book I'll be, or the campaign I'll be sharing with you today is actually for a small sketchbook that I did uh, in 2019. But that is me. Let us learn next from Carl Kiesel. Um, okay, thanks, thanks, Lila. Um, Carl Kiesel, I've uh, worked in the industry many, 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 many years. <laughs> and uh, after all those many years, I really uh, wanted a chance to do creator owned, which I never really had a chance to do. And uh, I couldn't do it until Kickstarter came along because I, I work very slowly. I do not work quickly. And uh, it's very hard for me to find extra time to work on something for free. I had to find some, some way that I could raise money to pay my bills while I was doing this uh, creator-owned stuff. And Kickstarter was the only way I could do that. And uh, a few years ago, Tom Grummet and I, we kickstarted a book called Section Zero. This is the Spanish edition. This is the one I grabbed. It's, of course, the Spanish edition. We did not kickstart the Spanish edition. But we did kickstart Section Zero, finishing off a uh, story we started in 2000. So that was 2018. So 18 years later, Kickstarter allowed us to finish the book. Based on that, um, I've gone with uh, David Hahn, and we've kickstarted a, a book called Impossible Jones, another graphic novel that was very successful. I do not have a copy right here, but I do have um, the original art to the upcoming Impossible Jones Scout comic. And this is the first issue's cover. And um, so that will be coming out later this year. But right now on Kickstarter, David and I are kickstarting the second, uh, more or less volume of Impossible Jones. Uh, instead of a graphic novel, this time we are kickstarting a, a floppy comic. It's a 28 page story with a uh, right now four page backup. Uh, so that's 32 pages of story. It'll probably be a 40 page book. And uh, that's on Kickstarter right now. And uh, we've already funded, we've already cracked a few stretch goals and we got a couple more weeks to go. Not quite a couple weeks, but we're doing really happy. We're doing well, I'm very happy. And uh, this, is, this is how I, I pay my bills nowadays. And uh, it's exhausting and exhilarating and I love it and I hate it and I, I wouldn't change anything. Awesome, thank you, Carl. Uh, Ron, I accidentally put you on mute, I think so, but you're next. So I unmuted, but thank you for putting me on mute because you, you did it right after I laughed at something Carl had said. And I always laugh at Carl, so it's good to have me on mute whenever Carl's talking. <laughs> and since Carl is such a terrible promoter of his own stuff, this is his Impossible Jones book. It's right here and it's gorgeous. And it's, it's a great, beautiful hardcover. Keep one handy, Carl. I, I recommend it. I, I gave one to Isaac this morning. That anyway. My copy in the in studio, I gave it to Isaac and he's got it. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, like Carl, I have been working in comics for decades and decades and um, started my career uh, working at DC Comics uh, and did some work for Marvel as well. Uh, then I got to create my own. I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time and I got to create my own series uh, for Dark Horse way back when they were first starting out. And he was Trekker, a young woman is a bounty hunter in it's a science fiction comic. 
and and everything in that sentence is completely non-commercial. Back then, especially in the mid '80s, you weren't you know science fiction comics weren't weren't being done. They weren't being sold. Uh, it was a little black and white comic book for a brand new company, and it featured a a female in an action adventure role. And I had a dress practically. She was dressed head to foot with pads and straps and armor and weaponry. But Dark Horse uh, was a young, uh, enthusiastic company full of young bucks like myself. And so they let me do it. They didn't say, wait a minute, Ron, this might not be the right environment to launch a book like that. But anyway, we got it started. Um, I loved working on it. They supported it. Uh, so I, I, I created the book that way. But uh, it became rough sledding after a while to, to make it sell well enough that it could sustain me. So eventually I put the project on hold. Um, Kickstarter comes into all this because years later when I was, uh, I, I'd always wanted to get back to telling the rest of Tracker stories. And when I finally realized that um, through the advent of social media and being able to make a web comic and eventually turn to Kickstarter, that's how I've been able to get back to funding the rest of these stories. And I was gratified to find out that when I launched the first campaign, it got a, a good reception, <laughs> a surprisingly good one to me anyway. And so now I've done uh, five uh, Kickstarter campaigns to produce new Trekker stories telling the rest of the, the journey. So for a guy like me who's spent a lot of my time being a gun for hire, drawing issues of you know Star Wars for, for uh, Dark Horse or, or Predator or Supergirl or Justice League for DC or whatever, uh, nothing matches being able to work on my own series um, and especially to be able to work with my own readers to keep the books happening, uh, which is the power and glory of Kickstarter. Like Carl says, it's it's exhausting, it's thrilling, <laughs> it's the most demanding uh, time in my career, and it's also far and away the most fulfilling time I've ever had. Um, this is the, the the copy of uh, my latest um, Trekker issue. Uh, Hunter's Moon is the name of this one, and uh, the one I did be before that was a much larger scale um, project. I, I went back and collected all the earlier Trekker stories that had done through Dark Horse. And um, and this is actually Carl's suggestion was to collect all those because those were all out of print now. And so I put out this great big hardcover, um, 500 plus pages of Trekker stories. So um, that's one thing we might get into as we talk about Kickstarter is, is you can do everything from a, a little mini comic like, like Layla did. Uh, to uh, you know, uh, floppy comics like the one Carl's doing now for Impossible Jones's next issue, to trade paperbacks uh, uh, to big hardcovers, um, yeah. and each of those campaigns, you have to scale up or down the, your your scope, your 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 price points, the amount of money you're asking for, all these real world business decisions that you have to make, and you've 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 got to approach it that way. You've you've got to take it seriously and realize that real numbers are involved here. So. <laughs> Yeah, awesome. I liked what you said about like the scale of it. It could be a smaller scale to a larger scale book. On that note, I think it might be appropriate for me to ask the group, like, how do you like to set up your page and what kind of rewards do you like to offer? And I'm actually going to start with myself because I, the one that I'm sharing is a small scale book. Oops, there's me looking up Carl Kiesel. <laughs> and if I can view my, <laughs> if I can view my website. Okay, cool. So this is what I set up my Kickstarter to look like. Uh, it was very simple. Um, kind of ignore the top part here. This wasn't live when my campaign was live, but I set it up with a video. I won't play the video, that'll take too much time. Um, I had a brief story about the gist of who I am and what this project is about. And I also liked to include the like visual uh, I, I liked to make the titles, I guess, um, an illustration because that just kind of, I think, caught my eye when I was looking at other people's Kickstarters and I would have them throughout. Um, I would also have visual examples of what my rewards were going to be. And I also, I liked to put my finances in there because I also liked when other Kickstarters had transparency with finances. Um, and then the risks and challenges thing. And then I had various rewards and I was able to offer my past comics as rewards. And then I had, um, I think I offered sketches and like postcard prints um, as well as like the digital and print version of the 
of the book. Um, so that's kind of how I set up mine. And it felt more small scale because I didn't get to offer like full comic book pages. Yeah, so I'm going to stop sharing. But if anyone has any questions about my page, feel free to drop it in there um, and we'll address it later. But Carl or, and Ron, who wants to go first with talking about your page and how you set up your Kickstarters? Carl, you go. Okay, well, um, with this, uh, I mean, really what happened was uh, David and I started to do Impossible Jones 2, another graphic novel. And uh, I, I'll just say my instinct was telling me we were rushing into it. We were rushing from a movie to a movie. And, and I really wanted to do smaller stories to really expand the universe and really focus on the characters as opposed to a big event. And so um, that's why we decided to do four floppies. This is the first one, and it will be basically Impossible Jones teaming up with another character from her uh, from her universe. And it, it, they're much more small scale stories, but I really think that that will give her world a lot more depth and texture. And uh, and it, it feels really good to me. So so we scaled back from really we would have needed fifty or sixty thousand dollars to fund the uh, to fund the graphic novel. And in this case, you know. Uh, we had a goal of 20,000 basically, and we're, we're beyond that. And uh, like Leela, if, if you want to scroll down a little, um, you know, I, I include a lot of graphics. Um, this time around, I actually did not use Kickstarter's formatting. Everything you see here is a graphic that I've inserted, even when you see body copy. That way I could use my own fonts and my own colors. Uh, and um, so there's, there's a a real look I tried to give this. It was a look that I felt reflected the book. It's bright, it's open, it's got kind of a lively, bouncy feel. Um, and you know, since we've hit our stretch goals or, or, and stuff, that's what you're seeing right now. And, and really where it says Impossible Jones here in the quote, this is a quote from Mark Wade. That's where my page originally began. And I started it with a quote, hopefully that would catch people's attention who didn't know what Impossible Jones was or who, who she was. And then a real quick synopsis of what the book is. You know, the idea of the, uh, this is the plot. Here's what you get in the book. We got two alternate covers. We got a, a back story, a, a bonus solo story in the back. There's the cover to the comic coming up. I try to hit all the high points really quick because not everyone is going to go very far down this uh, scroll. They're going to, by now they've decided if this interests them or not, you know? So you want to front load it with as much, um, that's going to grab them as possible, you know, and that's really my, uh, my whole approach. Uh, something quite honestly that I learned from Ron Randall is that, you know, way back at the top where it describes uh, what the concept is right up here, impossible to blah, blah, blah. Ron is really big on making sure that right away you tell people what they're paying for 32 page comic book. The page count is right there. The format is right there. Who does it is right there. Um, cause there's a lot of Kickstarters out there. I don't know how many pages their book is. You have to scroll and scroll and scroll and it says graphic novel, but is that 48 pages? Is that 400 pages? You know, this is a lesson I learned from Ron. Make sure it's very clear what the people are paying for right up front. Um, the Sutherlands had a comment about uh, what you were just talking about. That was a great idea, Carl. The graphics of the cane really communicate the fun feeling of the comic. Well, thanks. I mean, that's really the whole point. Yeah. And I didn't invent this. I mean, I learned this from Craig Rousseau. When he ran a Kickstarter, I, I noticed he had done all of his body copy as graphics. And I thought it looked great. It looked different from all the other Kickstarters. He had found a size to work in that worked on phones and tablets and computers. And I, I swiped it all. I stole it. Awesome. Thank you, Carl. All right, Ron, you go. Okay. Well, um, a lot of what I did on my campaign uh, will be will in approach. I, I learned a lot about this from from Carl. Uh, Carl helped me set up and run my very first campaign. So um, I did a video. Um, and one thing I think I'll say here to try to say things that Carl and Leila haven't covered yet is when you go to make your video, I watched there's a little instructional video from Kickstarter on what to do when you make your Kickstarter video. And one thing they stress is it's less important that your video looks particularly slick and professional and high production values, and more important that your video conveys what what backers are most what backers most respond to, and that is the sense of enthusiasm and passion and the personal the personal appeal, the personal connection that that they want to have with you and that you want to make to them. 
And I mentioned that here because that's why I try to do my videos. You just need to be you. Uh, what, what you is and your personality should come through in the video and your entire you know, pitch to a certain extent because that's what your project is. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be you. Um, you're not doing something impersonal or you're doing a job of something that belongs to somebody else. You're not carrying out somebody else's vision to life you're breathing life into your own with these backers help. So the more they can feel like they're hearing directly from you um, with a straight talk communication, I think that's helpful. Anyway, um, so yes, like Carl, I set up my campaign, but after it runs or as it's running, I, I tend to put at the top of the campaign, what we're seeing here, stretch goals. So if we wanna scroll down a little bit, I did make a little chart where as I hit each stretch goal, I would have the, the spaceship rise up and in, illumine the next stretch goal. Carl said he learned, he got some tips from looking at Craig Rousseau's uh, campaign. I cribbed this from another campaign that I'd seen that had a similar little, uh, just a graphic for the stretch goals. Um, and uh, the point I would make about that is if you want to run a Kickstarter campaign, maybe the best thing you can do is back a lot of Kickstarter campaigns first. Um, not only are you getting a group of people that might be willing to support you, but every one of those campaigns you look at and you might see things there that will really help to give you a great idea for something you'd want to do on your own. Um, let's see, what else did I do? Yeah, the having the description set up first um, with the specifics, the page count and the format of what you're doing. And then right after that, a, you know, a good strong image of the property or the project you're gonna make. Um, and then a quick capsule summation of, of the project. What's this particular story about? And if you can get a good quote or two from, a, from an established professional that give you some, some bona fides there, that's, that, that is something that I, I, I will sometimes make me pay a little bit more attention. Um, and then after that, I, uh, what did I do here? I just, I just mentioned since, since I've done several other video, uh, <laughs> videos, campaigns of this series, I wanted to let people know that. So that's what that graphic there is, the previous volumes of the campaign that I had done. And then after that, I think I just got, got into, um, yeah, I, I, I put together um, quite often what, what I've done in the past, what is often done is you show a series of some of the pages from the book. Uh, in my case, I did like a montage of a bunch of images. I wanted to get something that was a little bit more compressed and felt like clipping your way through a, a, a movie trailer or something to give a quick overall flavor for the rough and tumble feel of this particular story. And uh, then after that, I think I get into just, you know, what the, uh, the rewards, yeah. So this is where we can get into maybe talking about those reward tiers and stuff like that. One other thing I'll say before we do that though is um, one of the most crucial decisions you have to make when you're getting ready to run a Kickstarter is how much do you want to ask for? And in Carl's case and in my case, I know we try to set our goals as such as if we are professional artists that are doing this for a living, not a hobby, which means part of what we try to build our, into our campaigns is enough to pay ourselves um, for getting the work done. And which is why you will sometimes see people running a campaign for a graphic novel and they're asking for a couple thousand dollars. Other people run a campaign for graphic novel and they'll ask for 50 or $60,000. You wanna start off the bare minimum is what does it cost you to, to get the book printed and then shipped. Those are the huge, those are the huge financial costs. But beyond that, if you're doing the work all yourself or you're working with other writers, artists, creators, do you wanna pay those people for this work? Or are you just doing this in your spare time? Um, we're not. Um, so uh, maybe that's enough for me for, for a quick overview. Yeah, that's perfect. Um, you can stop sharing your screen. Thank you so much, Anina, for doing that. What you ended on, it kind of ties into this next question, which is, could you walk through how you came up with the numbers, the prices you put on Kickstarter? That seems to be where I hit my wall in planning, which I ran into those problems a lot too. So what is the planning process for you guys that you think about when it comes to your pricing, your rewards, and your entire overall uh, goal, financial goal. Carl, go first. Yeah, I, I'll just say that um, since, since I just just did this, as Ron said, I, I mean, I'm, I have to pay myself. I have to pay bills. I have to support a family. And, uh, and I'm paying, you know, David Hahn to pencil it. I'm paying 
uh, Tony Avina to color it. I'm paying uh, Comic Craft to letter it. Um, so, and then, you know, I have to say, one of the things I learned is, you know, you figure out how much the talent costs, but then you have to also have to figure it out how much you need to pay, pay yourself or how much your time is worth for running the Kickstarter, for dealing with the Kickstarter, for dealing with fulfillment. That takes a ton of time, tons of time. And I have actually come up with a very rough, rough estimate that it costs me $600 a page to produce a comic. So if I'm doing a 10 page comic, I'm going to have to raise $6,000 just to pay for the comic. That isn't the printing, that isn't the shipping. Um, and so that's my, my, my starting point, $600 a page. And I multiply that by the number of pages. Um, I will say the comic uh, that I'm doing now, I, I started saying it was a 30, 30 page comic because it was easy to do the math. So 30 times six is $18,000. And um, then I had to add in printing and I got some printing quotes and um, that I, I think the printing quotes was like right around 4,000. So that put me at 22. Now Kickstarter takes 10%. So that 22, you have to add, add another 2,200 to. So I'm at about 24 and change at this point. And, the, and then this is the other thing that comes in. Then you start to consider the psychological um, attitude of the backers. And if I'm asking for 25 thousand for a floppy comic there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say he's never going to get there and quite honestly i i talked to a good friend charlie stickney he does white ash comics and this is exactly what he said he said carl if you ask for twenty five thousand, people will think you will never make it and they won't support you hmm. and so he suggested i i set my goal at fifteen thousand. And uh, if I had done that, I would have been funded in the first day. But I was worried that I'd get funded and then people would say he's funded and leave. And I would be stuck with the other $10,000 bill. So I set it at 20,000 because I knew I could scrape together 5,000 out of my own pocket if I had to. Now we're at 26,000. So my worries are gone at this point. I actually have paid myself and all my collaborators and the printer all exactly what they need to be paid. So we're, we're good. We're good. But I'll tell you, you know, that was a bit of a gamble. It was worrisome. I didn't want to pay $5,000 out of my own pocket if we were funded and then, you know, stopped raising money. I mean, that's, that's how I come up with my initial goal. You know, there's a little psychology involved and then just some hard numbers and uh, you, you go with what you feel good about. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't get into what, how, you know, pricing your books. I mean, maybe Ron can talk about that since I've yeah, yammered on enough right now. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Ron, go ahead. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I'll say that um, you can take all these different approaches in setting your, your targets. Carl has always been a little bit bolder than I have uh, about being very upfront about saying, look, it's going to cost me, you know, like, like you said, you know, a number say $600 a page. So if I want to do this book, um, had I done that with my first campaign, I, I would have asked for a lot more than I did. I, my first target for my first trade paperback was $15,000 which I knew would be enough to cover the cost of the printing and the shipping and all that stuff, but it wasn't paying me more than a pittance to, to do the work. And, and uh, there were reasons I was able to do that then. The main reason being, we don't need to get into the whys and wherefores, but I already had pretty much the work was already done and I'd been able to do that. Um, but that's not a sustainable thing. So anyway, fortunately it, it, it made that very quickly and it went on to, to make me enough money to actually give me you know, s some money in pocket. And since then the campaigns have done better and better. So I'm sort of working to get to the point that Carl is at where he runs a campaign and it's pretty much a given that if it succeeds, I will have made myself a living wage at it, so to speak. Um, I just took, I was able to, I was in a position where I could take a little bit of a more graduated step approach to get there. Um, and so far so good, I'd say. Um, Franny, Price points on the books. Well, um, honestly, it's a combination of, of seeing what you think the market will bear by looking at some other campaigns that are out there. Uh, the, 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 the books that had come out through, through Dark Horse, uh, the Trekker books, I'd put out a couple of trade paperbacks with them before I moved to Kickstarter. I saw what those price points were. I didn't want to be, I, I wanted to be within the same rough scale of those. Although I came to realize not only are the Kickstarter books they're bigger and better <laughs> because I can stretch goals. I can add and make the books much more enhanced. Um, but also I'm not Dark Horse or, or DC or I'm not a volume dealer like that. Uh, I'm making something that's more of a, much more of a, 
a cottage industry sort of sort of thing. So um, so I could be justified perhaps in taking the price up a little bit, but I, I still don't um, try, try to keep it within the realm of, of respectability and reasonability. One thing that I do, um, uh, I ta uh, the, one, there's a person at Kickstarter whose job it is to help consult with and keep, run and keep an eye on the, the comic books and graphic novels part of Kickstarter. And uh, at their suggestion, um, I, I had was preparing a campaign. I was going to ask fifteen dollars for the if you wanted just the trade paperback, and I was printing a small exclusive um, little print that went to every backer as just a thank you gesture for the people that were willing to support me on Kickstarter. And I was also going to give them the digital copy of the book. And and the Kickstarter person said, you know, if you just sold that trade paperback, that would be about fifteen dollars, and you're giving them other things besides. So. Um, so she said, I think you should charge $25. You should ask $25 for that reward level. And I did. And it worked great. So um, somebody who knows, somebody who works there and sees a lot of campaigns has a much broader view than I did. And uh, so that worked out and it really helped me get to the goal I needed to. And Ron, is this a, an employee of Kickstarter who is there to yeah. help people? Mm -hmm. Awesome. That's great to know. So basically you just email their help center? Yeah, I, I think, uh, as I recall, I... Um, I, I did a, I, first I, I said I'd done past campaigns and they, they got about these kind of numbers and I'm thinking about doing a campaign now. But it was really when I when I when you build your Kickstarter campaign, you, you put in the, 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 the graphics and the, you know, the, the reward levels and all that stuff. And then you can share that to to people like I share mine when I'm building my I share with Carl and Carl give me <laughs> and he gives me great you know input and suggestions and you can also I could also then share it with uh, the this, this uh, woman at Kickstarter um, and um, and I, I had a few specific questions about exactly what we're talking about how much should I how much should I you know price the rewards at if I want to try to hit this this funding goal, because I was stretching for a higher funding goal and was nervous about it, it's every time you hit that launch button on Kickstarter, you didn't know what's going to happen, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, so building the campaign and it's in I guess a preview mode, and then you can share that with a few people before the campaign goes live. It's an invaluable uh, it's an invaluable step in the process. Awesome. So we've been talking about funding coming from seasoned professionals where we already have kind of a built-in audience. Someone did just ask, do you have tips for possible for, wait, do you have tips for people who don't have a huge social media following? I feel like Kickstarter depends a lot on how many people would see it if I personally advertised it. Do you have any insight on the perspective of someone who's new at, at uh, crowdfunding? Well, well, I mean, I don't, think Ron and I have huge social media followings by any means. Um, but I mean, the important thing is being able to get your, get the word out about your project. And uh, I hammer home uh, in every update I send out, you know, share this tweet, share this tweet, share this tweet, because you know people I don't, you know, but the people you know, like the things you like. And if you like this, you're the people you know, they might like this too. They'll probably thank you for telling them about this. You know, I mean, that's the only way you can do it. I mean, the people that follow me on, on Facebook or on Twitter, that is not enough to fund my projects. There's just no way. Yeah, and I yeah, come, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say like, you, you do kind of have to be like the shameless self-promoter and Ron, you warn everyone ahead of time that you know, you're like, sorry, this is gonna be the month that I'm gonna be posting about Trekker three times a day. Do you wanna get into that? Yeah, um, well, a couple things about that. So when I was getting ready to run my first campaign, um, I actually, uh, some another guy who'd run a Kickstarter campaign recommended that I talk to this particular consultant about, who was a consultant about crowdfunding projects and stuff like that. So I did. And what this woman said to me was, um, she just gave me a whole bunch of, of sort of generic strategies to use, all of which sounded completely antithetical to who I am as a human being and everything I believe in. <laughs> and I wound up doing almost all of or as many of them as I could possibly stand to do. One of them that she said was, and I think she was taking this from the approach of somebody who doesn't have a, a huge uh, um, social media following and that sort of stuff, but it's called crowdfunding because you need a crowd, right? So, so her thing was before you do your campaign, before you launch your campaign, send out 100 emails to basically everybody in your life, friends, neighbors, coworkers, relatives, 
ex-girlfriends, <laughs> whatever it might be. And, it, and she gave me very specific things to mention in that email, for, um, describing really quickly, you know, what Kickstarter is, what you're doing on Kickstarter and why you're there and how they can pledge and why it's important that they pledge um, to help you bring your dream to life, that sort of thing. When I, again, when I launched my first campaign, I didn't know what the support was going to be. So I, I took that advice to heart as much as I could. I didn't send out a hundred emails, I, but I, I forget how many it was now, but I, I sent out a bunch of emails just to, just to people that I, that I, not everybody that I knew, but you know, to a lot of people. And so if you don't already have a big, a big, you know, following on social media. And of course, big is a relative term, isn't it? Some people may have 50 followers. Some people may have 5,000 followers. If you got 5,000 followers and then you look at Gail Simone, who's got, I don't know how many tens of thousands, you think you don't have much of a following. I have roughly a couple thousand people that follow me on Twitter and a couple thousand that follow me on Facebook. And uh, I know people have many, many more than that, but you know, you go with what you got, right? Um, but yes, another thing that, that this, uh, this consultant said jet suggested or ordered me to do is a better way to that's what she <laughs> was yes I, I posted i think i post about four or five times every day on facebook and once every three hours on twitter 24 7 for 30 straight days and she said that to me and i i don't remember the noise that i made but she knew that it was resistance and she just said this is what you need to do ron because again she was coming from the position of i probably don't have a massive bunch, bunch of people are just going to avalanche me with pledges when I launch. And um, I mean, I don't know if she was right or wrong. All I know is I did it and it has worked for me for five campaigns and counting. I mean, a real key part of that to me is if you just do the same sort of generic social media message over and over again, um, I would certainly get tired of seeing that from somebody, even a friend, even a studio mate, if they just said, yeah, please back my campaign. Here's here's the image. So I really do try to um, try to make each one of these, you know, have something different about the graphic and something that's sort of a little bit informative or maybe clever in my dad humor sort of way uh, to, to make it a bit entertaining. So that if they if I if I impose upon them and interrupt their Twitter feed or their their Facebook scrolling, I like to think that they might be at least a little bit amused by it. And, and while I felt very self-conscious about being that relentless, uh, in one of my campaigns, I, I was on about day 27 of a 30-day campaign of all these relentless posts, right? And I got a, a response to one of my posts on Facebook from one of my studio mates who is in the world of comics and is a personal friend of mine and is active on social media. And what he said was, oh, how come I haven't heard about this before? <laughs> so my take my takeaway from that is not everybody's on social media all the time and here I was almost at the end of my campaign and still people were hearing about it for the first time because of my I don't I my hun my however many hundreds of tweets and posts I'd done by now so what I guess I'm saying is the consultant kind of knew what they were talking about that's awesome okay question let us start with the first one we didn't answer yet. If you're working on a narrative comic, how much of the story do you want to include in the campaign? Just a logline or much more? Carl, would you like to go? Um, I don't know. I think like four or five pages is good. Um, I know I did a, a Kickstarter for a second, sec second section zero book a year or so ago. And uh, there were eight page monster stories that we were doing, like the old Marvel monster stories. And so I wanted to include a whole eight page story. And the woman that Ron was talking about who runs the comics division or what at the time was in charge of the comics division at Kickstarter, she goes, eight pages, that's too much. No one's gonna look at eight pages. Yeah. She said, you know, do four pages. And I said, but that like stops in the middle of the story. And um, I really wanted people to get a sense for the whole thing. But what I did was, I actually said, uh, if you backed the project, the last four pages were in the first update. And so you could always go to the first update to see the last four pages. But I, I, I mean, since then, yeah, four or five pages to show, to get a feel of the comic, the, the um, tone of it, the look of it, certainly. Um, they don't always have to be sequential, but I like, I personally like sequential. I like to know what the, the um, rhythm of the book is, you know? So uh, that, that's what I would say, you know, four or five pages is all you really need. At the beginning of your Kickstarter careers, 
did it take more time to gain traction or have you had relative success in having like a lot of funding up front and then more trickling in as the campaign goes? I, I would just say uh, my very first Kickstarter section zero, um, I was convinced at the halfway point, I, I did not do what Ron was saying. I, I was trying to be like a responsible worker. So I would post in the morning and at my lunch break. And when I made dinner, I'd post three times a day and I did like no interviews. I, I just really didn't know what I was doing. And I just kind of felt people would find me. In fact, I was getting a lot of press that I wasn't asking for. I was very lucky. But the thing was, is, is that halfway through the 30 days, Ron and another friend, Steve Madsen, were, were at my house. And I said, we're not going to make it. We're at 50. We're halfway through the, uh, the Kickstarter uh, time period. And I'm not at 50%. I have not raised 50% of my money at the halfway point. And there's no way I'm going to raise more than 50% in the second half. I, I figured it was a downhill slope. And on the last day, I raised $15,000. I raised one third of my goal on the last day of the campaign. And it had nothing to do with me. I mean, I was actually sitting there at my computer going, this is going to fail. I want to make this book. And, and I was reworking the campaign to launch as soon as possible. And as I was working on it, I was bing, bing. And then like the social media giant, you know, woke up and people just started sending in pledges and money. And we raised $15,000 on the last day and exceeded the goal. But I did not expect that to happen. Wow. Ron, what about you? Um, well, all of my campaigns fortunately have funded pretty quickly, uh, hit, their, hit their initial funding goal pretty quickly. Partially that's because I set more modest, um, more tentative, more timid <laughs> initial funding goals than, than Carl did on some of his campaigns because my heart isn't strong enough. I, I couldn't be there coming down to the last day saying, I need $50,000 <laughs> to get funded. So hats off to Carl for having the, the strength of character to do that. You know, and I will say I was, I was really uh, shocked and gratified to see the first, when I, when I hit that first launch button, you know, I thought, you know, there might be a handful of people out there who are going to want to support Tracker. I really didn't know, but it funded within, I'm trying to remember now, maybe the first day and a half it hit that funding goal. And, um, then the second campaign funded in like eight hours. So um, it started it started good for me and has and has gotten better. I got to say, um, but the the general um, the general pattern for just about any Kickstarter campaign that I've heard about or seen on my own is when you at least if you're somebody like like say Carl or I who who have a certain who have a certain presence. Let's just put it that way. As, there's a certain awareness and and um, baked in support for us. Uh, for, for a lot of campaigns, you hit the launch button and there's an immediate rush that usually in the first day or two, you get a lot of, you get a lot of your traffic comes in there. And then at some point around somewhere between day, maybe three and day five, it's like somebody just pulled the plug out of the bathtub and it's just boom, you're, you're just, you're in, I call it the kickstarted doldrums and you're just inching along from day to day and you're, you're, you know, the, the backing, the traffic just really, really slows down. And again, that's a relative term. For some people, that may be go days without getting a single pledge. For others, it means that you get you know five or six pledges this day. But it tends to be pretty steady then, I think, for most campaigns. Unless you do something in the middle of the campaign to, to add some new exciting rewards or, or get a major you know, media you know, interview thing happening to promote it more. Uh, and then, and then uh, but all hope is not lost because most campaigns do spike up again in the last couple of days. Uh, maybe not as much as Carl's kind of spectacular rocket launch there on the last day, but but it's often enough to really um, to, to bring in quite a bit more measurable money. So that's the general the general scope of things. So awesome. you've got to you you got to sort of plan for the long haul. And, and you know one other thing I want to mention real quick. Uh, I know we don't have much time, but. Um, Carl and I together went to watch uh, a woman do a talk about a book that she had written called, you know, how to, on how to fund Kickstarters that she funded with a Kickstarter. And one of the things that she said, and we did, Carl had already run his first campaign, but I hadn't. So I was really, you know, a, a newbie just taking everything in I could. And one thing she said was, when you run a Kickstarter campaign, you need to treat it like a job like another part-time job or a full-time job. And I thought, I don't have the extra time to do that. But when I launched that campaign, something kicked in and I knew I had to be all in. So I really did treat it very seriously like a job. And um, 
and I have no regrets about that. I, I now have to, like Carl said, you have to budget the time. But if, if you want to do this, unless you've got a great big audience or a very, very small goal, you need to apply yourself to it and invest in it to get the payoff you want. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, like Ron said, in the middle of the campaign, it's, it's, a, it's a game of inches. You know, you're not, you're not getting the big. But I mean, like I just, something that just happened for me was uh, they released the new trailer for the new Suicide Squad movie, which features King Shark in it, a character I created. And I'm really thrilled he's going to be in the movie. And he's voiced by Sylvester Stallone, which um, I think just is so great. But I posted the trailer on my Facebook page and on Twitter. And on Twitter, I mean, I get like 10 likes. Maybe if I'm really lucky, I get 100 likes. I was getting thousands of likes on this. And I was having <laughs> hundreds of comments. And so I have to say on Facebook, I put a comment. And it was, you know, if you guys really like King Shark, I I'm doing this Kickstarter right now. And I got, I got sales off of that. You know, yeah. you got to take advantage of what falls in your lap. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's awesome. Well, we are sadly out of time. I'm sorry we didn't get to these other excellent questions, but you guys have been amazing. Thank you so much for being a wonderful audience and asking such poignant questions. Ron and Carl, you always have such great wisdom when it comes to this. I often <laughs> hear pages when I'm trying to design my own. So thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with all of us today. Thank you so much, you guys. And <laughs> thank you, Layla. And yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, one more panel of the day. Yes. I am off to that. Thanks, okay. everyone. Okay. See you later. Bye. <laughs>